Okay, we're on. We're starting. Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar this year on tax aspects of selling your home. My name is Katerina Davidova. I'm a broker associate with Compass. I know my last name is a mouthful to pronounce, so you can just remember my first name, Katerina. I have invited guest speaker for today's presentation, Larry Pon. He is a certified public accountant, certified financial specialist located in Redwood Shores. Before we start the presentation, a quick reminder, feel free to use the chat uh, function if you have any questions and we will do our best to answer it at the end of the presentation. Let's face it, selling a home is quite a difficult decision. There is an emotional aspect, uh, there's some logistics involved, and of course, uh, tax and financial consideration. The tax <coughs> rules are quite complicated, and if you don't plan properly, you can make a costly mistake. In order to avoid it, uh, uh, the topic of our today's presentation is tax aspects of selling a home. And without uh, further ado, I would like to invite our speaker, Larry. Thank you, Katerina, and hello, everybody. So for the next hour, we're going to talk about the tax aspects of selling in a home. And it's been really interesting the you know, last couple of years about selling homes. And I've noticed that quite a few people are going to owe some capital gains tax this year uh, when, they, when they sell their homes. So that's a pretty common occurrence. So today we're going to talk about how to calculate the profit from the sale of the home. How do I calculate the tax on the sale of the home? And what can you do to reduce the tax bill? And are there any pending tax law yeah, changes? That's right. So we're going to close. We're going to close with that. We're going to close with um, uh, what possible changes could be occurring. So let's get started here, and let's start with the very basics. So what's the formula when you sell the home? So we start with the sales price, and then we subtract from that the cost basis of the home, and then we, in the tax code, we have something called a gain exclusion. Subtract so that, that's uh, $250,000 if you're single, $500,000 if you're married filing jointly. <clears throat> and then from there, we, we get our taxable gain. And that's what you got to pay taxes on. And that's the law we've had since 1997. For some reason, many people keep asking about the old law, which is before 1997, which is, oh, you know, I sell my house. I buy another house within two years. I can defer the gain, right? Well, that, that law changed back in 1997. So let's, let's get up to date to the current tax law and work with that. So first of all, the gain is most likely going to be a capital gain because you would, you would have owned the home for at least a year when, when you're selling property for more than a year, you get capital gains treatment. And so there's three tax rates for capital gains, the 0%, the 15%, and the 20%. And it's based upon what your income is. So if you're single and your income is less than $40,000, your capital gains tax is zero. The top rate is 20%. And you pay that when you hit $441,000. And these are the 2021 rates. 2022 is bumped up uh, actually quite a bit. And the reason the 2022 brackets are higher is because we had high inflation in 2021. And that's something we're hearing right now is the high inflation. For the month of December, the annualized inflation is 7%. If you're receiving Social Security benefits, your Social Security benefits increased by 5.9%, which is the highest increase in nearly 40 years. So as a result of inflation, the thresholds have also gone up. So if you're married filing jointly, you can have up to $83,000 of income and pay zero tax. So there's some planning we can do with these tax rates here. So um, most of our clients are probably in the 15% rate. That's when your income is less than $488,500 if you're married. Um, but then it, it goes up if you're... Um, if, if you're uh, uh, to the 20% rate, if your income is higher. So here's the, uh, I call it the menu uh, for taxes when selling a home. There's going to be some important docu documents you're going to need when selling a home. The first document is a form 1099S, and you'll get that from the title company when you sell the home. That's the gross sales price. That's the number on top of the closing statement. So the IRS knows that you sold a home. 
So some people say, well, I don't need to put on a tax return because my gain is very small and it's not taxable. Well, you need to report it and show to the IRS that it is not taxable. And that goes in form Schedule D, the capital gains and losses, and the details reported on Form 8949, the sales and other dispositions of capital assets. So those are the tax forms you need for reporting the sale of the home. I'll take a picture of it. I'll send it to you. Good. Hmm. Okay. Everybody should be muted, right? Okay. So anyway, um, in terms of reporting the sale, so the most important document from the sales is going to be the closing statement. It used to be called, it used to be called the, um, the HUD-1 statement, but now it's just called the closing statement. And on top of the form, it starts with the sales price. It starts with the sales price. And then it might break out uh, things that you're selling from the sale of the home. In some cases, not only the real estate you're selling, you could be selling personal property. Some people are selling the furniture, the uh, appliances, and all that with the house. That's personal property. In, in some cases, there's they're throwing in a car. Sometimes a car is thrown in there. I've seen that happen. Uh, boats. I've seen cars, boats, and airplanes as part of a sale of a home. So that's broken on the closing statement. So on the debit side, in terms of reduction of the sales price, are the selling expenses. And it reduces the amount of taxes you're paying. So it's important to include those selling costs. And most importantly, of course, are the commissions, the buyer's agents, the seller's agents. So that's disclosed on the closing statement. And then depending on which city you're located in, there's transfer taxes. So each city has their own transfer taxes. They, they vary from city to city. And sometimes the counties can charge transfer taxes. There could be escrow fees that the title company might be charging or the escrow agent might be charging. The city or town taxes, county taxes, and assessments. So those are costs related to the sale of the property. Other Settlement charges we see in the closing statement are, it could, be, it could be paying for a survey in terms of figuring out the boundaries of the property, a pest inspection, pest repairs, a septic inspection, septic repairs, property inspection, termite inspection, chemical treatments, title charges, settlement closing fees. Um, so Katarina, do you see any other, any other unusual charges you see on when you sell a house? Any, uh, in terms from the selling side, on the selling side, on the selling side, uh, sometimes you will see it in the settlement charges. However, for the Bay Area, most of the time, uh, the pass report and the property inspection reports will be paid outside of escrow. So it's very important to hold on to all the receipts uh, that uh, you have done uh, regarding the home improvements and then uh, cost of sales of the reports uh, that uh, will be done as part of um, uh, selling process, um, uh, hold on to it because uh, uh, most likely if you're selling the home in the Bay Area, the, the past report and property inspection reports, usually they are paid outside of escrow. Yeah, so so there, there are some costs that are paid outside of escrow that you, you either pay by check or something like that. So keep track of those costs. Yes. And, and those can, can help. Now, sometimes you have expenses that are paid on behalf of the seller. So sometimes you, you work out a deal with a vendor. Sometimes you need to paint the house. You need to uh, make some repairs to the house or, or stage the house. And sometimes you can negotiate with the vendor and you can tell the vendor that, look, um, I don't have a lot of cash right now, but uh, I, it, I can pay it out of closing. And so some, some of those costs could be uh, paid out of closing. So there's a, an agreement you sign for all that. And, and so, so don't forget about those costs. So costs paid on behalf of the seller. Um, there's some reductions of the amount due to seller. Now that's not going to reduce your, your um, net sales price. Like if you're paying off a mortgage, that's not going to reduce your net sales price. Uh, of course, you might have some interest and, and some other charges. And of course, some government taxes, county, city, town, or whatever, or assessments. So at the very bottom of the closing statement is the magic number, the amount due to seller. So those, those are, those are um, that's the amount that should be showing up in your bank account after the sale of the property. So the closing statement is going to be a very important document. So let's talk about that exclusion. It's Section 121 is known as the Section 121 exclusion. That's the tax code that uh, provides for this exclusion. 
as $250,000 for single, $500,000 for married flying jointly. And, and you're saying, well, that, that number hasn't changed for over 20 years. That's correct. It's for it to change, it has to be done via an act of Congress. So in, in, in the tax code, there are some numbers that the IRS has the authority to change with inflation or some numbers are indexed to inflation. Well, unfortunately, the exclusion is not indexed for inflation. And some economists have crunched the numbers to see what it would be if we did inf inflate it. And I think I think the um, the five hundred thousand in today's dollars is closer to um, eight hundred eleven thousand dollars, something like that. And the two hundred fifty thousand dollars is is closer to I think it's four hundred eleven or something like that. So so there's some articles about what it would have been if they if they indexed for inflation. So if you want to give some suggestions to your member of Congress, you might want to tell them that, hey, can, can you make that little change? Make it index for inflation because more and more of our homeowners are paying taxes because these exclusions are not indexed for inflation. But, but what's a huge component of a sales price of a home? Inflation. If I had it for 40 years, 50 years, a huge component of those of that sales is not because the house is more valuable; it's mainly because of inflation. So, if you if you want to write your member of Congress to have them make a positive change to people's taxes, tell them to index this to inflation. To qualify for this exclusion, there's two tests you have to meet. There's what's called the ownership test; you have to own the home, and there's the use test; you have to use the test as your principal residence. And at least two out of the last five years, two out of the last five years, it doesn't have to be consecutive. You have to count the, the period of time. As long as you meet that test, you qualify for this exclusion. So you might move in, move out of your house or whatever, and that happens. You, you rent it out for a short amount of time, you move back in. So just keep a good calendar to prove that you met this 24 months out of 60 month test. That's really important. But you have to meet both tests to qualify. So for, for example, a very common situation is you have a, a person who, who um, owns the home and, and her um, boyfriend has been living with her for, for, for years, but he doesn't own the home. He's not on title. Even though he's used the home as a principal residence, he doesn't own the home. So, so he's got to own the home to also qualify for the exclusion. So these two parts of tests are very important. Now, we run into this situation quite often where you have uh, two people who get married and they each have a house. He has a house, she has a house, and each of them have a house. And they say, hey, we're married now. Let's get our house, our together house. So one of them sells one house, the other sells the other house. You can't get the exclusion every year. You have to wait two years. So if the first spouse sells a home, wait two years for the second spouse to sell the house. So that way you can take advantage of the exclusion. So you can't sell two homes in one year. You can't sell uh, two homes one year after each if, if this exclusion is important to you. Otherwise, no exclusion, you'll pay whatever the capital gains taxes. So that's a very important planning tip. So, so when it comes to um, selling homes, there's some planning involved, planning involved. Now, this five-year uh, test could be suspended for various reasons. If you're a uh, qualified official, you have extended duty. If you're in the uniform services, in the military, foreign service, or intelligence community, so you can suspend this five-year test for up to 10 years. Um, and, and, and if you're in the military, you have to be on active duty and have to be under government order. So there could be some suspension of that. Some people sell their home via an installment sale. So most people don't do that. They just sell their house. The buyer gets a mortgage from the bank. Well, maybe you become the bank. So if you are going to be the bank and you have what's called an installment sale, you pay taxes on the gain as the principal of the notes being paid. And this exclusion is still available. So that's still possible. It's, it's risky, but it's still possible. Or for whatever reason, the, uh, the buyer can't get a loan with the bank. So, uh, so that, that, that's important to know. Um, yeah, $250,000 gain if you're single, $500,000 if you're married filing jointly. The houses that don't qualify is a house that was not your principal residence, 
which means a vacation home would not qualify, a second home would not qualify, a rental property might not qualify, own the home for less than two years. You did not live in the house for at least two in the last five years, or you already claimed this exclusion less than two years, or um, you got the house through a 1031 like kind exchange in the past five years. So if it was acquired via 1031 exchange, or you're subject to the expatriate tax. So the, what's the expatriate tax? That's when you uh, renounce your US citizenship and you have to pay the expatriate tax. You won't be able to use this exclusion. So how to qualify for this exclusion? You gotta live in the house for at least uh, two years and um, it's gotta be your principal residence. And then there's people of multiple homes. It's like, well, what if you have more than one home? That's a good question. So it's gonna be based on your facts and circumstances, keep good records, because um, you really can't have more than, what's the word principal? Principal means one. So um, so there's some planning involved here. If you're, you wanna sell your vacation home, well, you gotta make that your principal residence. In California, we have something called the homeowner's exemption. So that's very important. That's on your property taxes. So you can only have one homeowner's exemption, only one. So which house has that homeowner's exemption? That would be your principal residence. You're telling the state of California, this is my principal residence. You can always change it, but uh, you gotta make sure the facts are consistent. If you're saying this is your principal residence, make sure you have the homeowner's exemption on that house. If you have the homeowner's exemption on another house, that could be a problem. And this is public information. The, uh, you can go to the uh, tax collector's website, the tax assessor's website in the county, look up the tax bill, and you can see if there's a homeowner, homeowner's exemption claim or not. So it's public information. So when you say public information, yes, the IRS knows about it too. <clears throat> so what if, what if uh, you're selling a house in less than two years? Are there exceptions to this rule? Are there exceptions? Yes, there could be. There could be. So uh, it could be because of a, of a work situation, your job move. Uh, it could be a health situation. Yeah, you have to move because of health. It could be physical health and mental health or an unforeseeable event. So we'll talk about these uh, next here. Um, a little in the next slide. Types of properties, um, any type of real estate would qualify for this exclusion. Your single family home, a condominium, a townhouse, a co-op, a mobile home, a houseboat. RVs will not qualify, <laughs> but, but these, these type of properties would qualify because they're considered to be real estate. So what if you have a work-related move? So if, if you transfer to a new job at least 50 miles farther from home, and it, it doesn't have to apply to both spouses, it could be only one spouse. So I ran to a class, an example of this. Uh, this guy was working for a well-known company in Seattle, Washington, and he, he bought a house in Seattle. He bought a house and, and he thought he had a, a good job with this company. And the company says, no, you don't have a job with us anymore. <laughs> so so um, he was um, unemployed and he found a job in the Bay Area. So he sold his house. He had a pretty good gain for the short amount of time that he had his house in Seattle. But it was less than two years. It was less than two years. He had a pretty good size gain. But we were able to take advantage of this partial exclusion. So we did the math, we had documentation, Seattle to San Francisco is more than 50 miles and he is with a different company. It wasn't his choice, it was the company's choice. If you're moving on your, on your own idea, uh, that's not gonna qualify. It's gotta be a work-related move out of your control. You got laid off, um, your job situation changed. So if you decide to move, it would not qualify. It's gotta be outside of your control health-related move. You move to obtain, provide, or facilitate diagnosis, cure, mitigation, or treatment of disease, illness, or injury to yourself or a family member. And the family member doesn't mean someone you're claiming as dependent on your tax return. It could be because we have people live with their extended families, parents, grandparents, children, brother, sister, in-laws, uncle, aunt, nephew, and niece, family members. Um, but uh, if you want to claim a health-related move, make sure you get a letter from the doctor. And had a case, it was more of a, 
emotional problem. There's something wrong with this house. I don't know. Um, and it was causing causing the, the, the wife a lot of um, problems. So, so we got a letter from the psychologist explaining that this house was causing significant trauma to her and that she had to leave the house. Okay. And, and so they sold the house. Uh, had a gain. It's a, it was in Redwood City. Had a gain, and we took advantage of this exclusion. Got a letter from the doctor. So there's a lot of examples that the uh, that the IRS gives us, and the tax courts have given us. So this is litigated a lot. So we we get a lot of guidance from the litigation. Unforeseeable events can include the house was destroyed or condemned. You know, we had hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, those sorts of things. The home suffered a casualty loss. It could be a, a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. For example, a few years ago, we had the explosion in San Bruno. That was kind of a man-made disaster, an act of terrorism. And it doesn't matter if you claim the loss as a casualty loss or not in your tax return. So if you suffered an unforeseeable event. Or you, your spouse, co-owner, anyone for whom the house is a resident, if someone passed away, became divorced or legally separated, uh, gave birth to two or more children from the same pregnancy, uh, became eligible for unemployment compensation, and you became unable to pay basic living expenses. So if you have a change of circumstance, we might be able to claim this exclusion. And, and some can quite quite uh, interesting. I'm a real tax nerd, so I like to read tax cases. And some could be quite entertaining, more entertaining than what you see on TV. Uh, situation causing a sale rose during the time you own and use the home as your residence. You sold the home not long after the situation arose. So let's say something was wrong with the house, but, but you sold it uh, months later. You, you didn't really do anything about it. The IRS is not going to convince that it was an unforeseeable circumstance. You were living there for another six months. So you gotta, if, you, if you sold your house soon after you discovered the problem, you could not have been responsible. You could not have reasonable anticipate the situation when you bought your house. Um, you, know, you didn't know about it when you bought the house for whatever reason. You begin to experience significant financial difficulty maintaining a home. And we had uh, many of those cases during the uh, coronavirus uh, issues. The home became significantly less suitable as a main home for you and your family for a specific reason. So there's all kinds of details on that. So what if we have a divorce? Uh, that happens quite often, right? Um, so uh, the house could be transferred to the spouse or the ex-spouse as part of the divorce settlement. So and, and we see this uh, quite often, right? Where the house has a low cost basis, is worth a lot. So upon a divorce settlement, so let's say the, the husband gets the house or the wife gets the house, there's no gain or loss. There's no gain or loss. There's no sale per se, because it's part of a divorce settlement. So there's no gain or loss. There's nothing to report on the tax return. Now, however, the cost basis is still the same. There's no step up in cost basis. So it had a low cost basis. It will continue to have a low cost basis. It doesn't get adjusted as a result of a divorce. So that's something we got to be careful about. Now, it gets a little more complicated. If the spouse or ex-spouse is a non-resident alien, that's a different situation. Now, in that case here, uh, there is a gain or loss from the transfer, gain or loss from the transfer. So that's for... Uh, if it's a non-resident alien situation. But if you're a resident or a citizen, uh, as part of a divorce, there's no gain or loss. So that's part of the uh, negotiations and settlement you try to figure out in, in terms of a, of a marital dissolution. So this is part of it because for a lot of families, the house is their biggest asset. So you gotta look out for that. Okay. Oh, here's an example of, uh, of the partial exclusion. So uh, let's say we sell the house for $1.5 million. We paid a million dollars for it. And we had $105,000 in closing costs. And, um, and, and we bought it in uh, June 1st of 2015. Well, in this example here, the first set of facts, the gain is $395,000. And let's say they're married. So it's fully excluded. There's no tax to pay on this $1.5 million of sales proceeds. Now let's move the dates a little bit here. So let's say we bought it 
on June 19th of 2020 instead. So we haven't met the two year rule, uh, two out of five year rule. And let's say you qualify for the partial exclusion that we're talking about. So you would have a uh, partial exclusion. We have 12 months, we own the house, divided by the 24 month period. So that's 50%. 50% of 5 hundred thousand dollars that's the full exclusion is two hundred fifty thousand dollars so the gain here is three hundred ninety five thousand we can't exclude the whole 500 but we can exclude 250 so in this case here the taxable gain is one hundred forty five thousand dollars so that's in the case where you have this partial exclusion so it gets a little bit complicated so we talked about the sales side of the house we talked about the exclusion part of the house now, how can you lower your tax bill? The most important thing to do is calculate the cost basis of the home. The, the most, if you really want to annoy me, <laughs> I get a little grumpy. Um, and, you know, you ask the, you ask the uh, client, oh, what's your cost basis of the home? They go, I don't know. Don't do that. <laughs> you should know. You should know. It's important. Keep track of the cost basis of your home from day one. Don't throw away any of those receipts. As long as you own the home, it could be from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. Keep all those receipts. Don't toss them. Because I've seen people throw away their receipts. They say, well, I, was, I heard that you don't keep things for more than seven years. Well, if you still own the home, keep those receipts. Very important. Or some evidence of the cost basis. Guess what? The IRS knows how to use Zillow. They know how to use Zillow. So with Zillow, you can see the house being sold. You can see the house being bought. Or they can go to the county records and see that you bought the house for whatever price. And they look at Schedule D in your tax return. And they go, hmm, these numbers don't match. So this is low-hanging fruit for the IRS to audit. Speaking about the IRS, uh, the IRS is... Uh, is getting a little bit more funding now. They've been underfunded for years. They're shorthanded, but there's a slew of new IRS agents coming on board. And what do these new IRS agents need? They need training. What is training? Practice. They need practice. So what are they going to do? Audit, audit the sales of homes. That's easy money to find because most people can't document those numbers. So they get their practice on this. This is, this is, uh, these are easy audits because most people can't prove it. So what goes into the cost basis? Purchase price plus your closing costs, plus any refinance costs, because many people refinance multiple times, and the improvements made to the home. So it's important to keep track of those records. So when you're buying a home, that's the other closing statement that's going to be important. We want you to have the closing statement when you bought the home. So take a look at the closing statement when you purchase the home. And there's all kinds of fees that the buyer pays. But the buyer fee, not just the purchase price, but you might have abstract fees, utility hookup fees, uh, legal fees, uh, title search, recording, survey, uh, transfer stamps. Sometimes in some cities, the, the buyer pays the, the transfer taxes or half the transfer taxes. And it depends on city, the cities. Owners, owners title insurance. So there are all these costs you pay. Now, when you look at the closing statement, there's a whole bunch of numbers on it. Not all of them will count towards the cost basis. Um, sometimes you have to pay a, 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 the first year of fire insurance premiums. That doesn't add to the cost basis. Or what if you do a rent back? You know, you're, you're paying rent on the house before it closes. You're paying the owner some rent. Well, that's just rent. So that doesn't go to the cost basis. Uh, utility costs, uh, costs for electric, gas, water, Mortgage insurance premiums, that's, that's a different item that can be deducted on Schedule A. Mortgage interest, you might be charged some mortgage interest. Um, real estate taxes, uh, especially if you're um, escrowing the property taxes, sometimes there's a deposit for six months worth of real estate taxes. And if you live in an, a, what's called a planned uh, development, you might have homeowner association dues. And that, that does not count towards the basis. Those are ongoing dues for ongoing expenses. All right, construction. Um, sometimes you're building the house. It could be an existing house. You knock it down, you build a new house, or, or it's raw land. So what, what goes in there? Again, keep good records of this. Cost of the land. How much did it cost for you to buy the land? Uh, labor and materials. 
you don't count your own labor. I've, I've seen people do that in their spreadsheet. I see a line here saying, hey, I'm a software engineer. I make 200 bucks an hour. So I, I'm going to count that in as my cost of labor. Sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> can't count your own labor. Do not include labor for which you did not pay. So if you did not pay for the labor, don't count it. Uh, oh, it would have been worth uh, ten thousand dollars. Yeah, did you pay ten thousand? No. So no, don't include labor that you did not pay. Uh, controversially, uh, what have you paid in cash? Well, that's uh, that's a good question, right? Do you have documentation for the cash and uh, of of what you paid? And so you have to have documentation. Uh, architects fees, building permit charges, utility meter connection legal fees directly connected with building a house. Sometimes we have to incur some legal fees there. So let's talk about improvements. Um, the list of things, these are just a list. This is not everything, but this is the general list. Additions, you add a bedroom, bathroom, deck, patio, lawn and grounds, you know, around the house. That counts too. A lot of people leave that out. Landscaping, a driveway, fence, retaining wall, swimming pool, you know, look around the house, the exterior, we put windows, doors, roof, siding, insulation, um, your, your systems in the house, uh, HVAC, uh, central vacuum, security system, wiring, piping, those, those kind of things, plumbing, septic system, water heaters, filtration systems. Then let's look inside the house, uh, built-in appliances, so not, not the microwave that you can move around, not the air fryer that you can pick up and move around, but built-in appliances, kitchen remodel costs, flooring, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, and fireplace, that's interior. And then this is where we get into arguments with people about the um, what's not improvements. And this is where people get in trouble here too. And uh, repairs and maintenance are not an improvement. By definition, Painting is not an improvement. I know it could be expensive. I've seen some pretty heavy bills for a painting, $30,000, $50,000 to paint a house. Well, according to the tax code, by definition, it is a repair. Okay, so we're not going to count painting in there. Uh, fixing leaks, you know, leaks, fixing holes and cracks, replacing broken hardware, you know, like the new doorknob and stuff like that. Uh, improvements are no longer part of the house. You know, old wall-to-wall -wall carpet. You, you pulled out the carpets, you're not going to count them again. They're not there anymore. Uh, anything with life expectancy of less than a year. Uh, if you claim solar energy credits on the solar panels, you got the credit for them. You can't count them again as an improvement. So you can't double dip. Watch out for that. So I want Katarina's uh, input on this because I've seen clients spend way too much money on renovating before they're selling or incurring a lot of stress. And my take, this is just my take on it, is that you're delaying on when your house is going to get sold. You're incurring costs and most likely the buyer is going to do their thing anyway. So all the hard work you did, I've seen, I've uh, driven around, I've seen uh, the buyers just re totally redo what you just did. So so, so when, when you see a, uh, a client who wants to sell their house, Katarina, what do you think about that, about renovations? I think uh, everything needs to be taken into account on a case-by-case -case scenario. There's not like a magic formula. If you're selling a house, you need to renovate it. And I think before you start renovating it, uh, first of all, you have to make a decision. If you, have, you, you are doing the renovation, for example, you want uh, you were dreaming of this beautiful kitchen and the bathroom. If you want to renovate it for yourself, uh, I would say go ahead and do it and take advantage of it and enjoy those renovations. But uh, if you want to renovate uh, just uh, because of the selling to bump up the value of your home, I would uh, stop you and say, think about it and uh, um, at the, uh, when you are selling a home, most likely you would um, interview a few realtors, select the realtor that would help you guide you through the process because uh, chances are sometimes with a little improvements, you can get where you want to be. Uh, for example, painting the house, uh, interior and exterior can uh, bring you more than just renovating the kitchen and the bathroom. So the word of advice is that uh, when you are thinking of selling a home, um, preparation is key 
and you would have to work uh, hand in hand with uh, your realtor to decide what are the most things that needs to be improved and what you can leave for the new owner to do it. Because what Larry just mentioned, buyers will renovate anyway, and you have to realize uh, doing the remodel into your house and renovation takes time. And sometimes your timeline, uh, say, for example, you have to move to your new place, your new destination, start your new chapter in a month's time. So timeline is very critical. That's why uh, it, it, all this needs to be considered before you make a plan how to prepare your house best for the market and get you uh, the high value under the present market circumstances. So uh, just um, don't jump into a renovation. Uh, make up your mind where do you need to be? What is your timeline? What is the budget? Sometimes people may not even have the budget to prepare a house and then work with uh, your real estate professional that you have selected to work with and make a, an action plan to proceed. Yeah, I fully and, agree and, with that. And now the one very, uh, I think uh, if you can just take one uh, thing from this webinar is uh, uh, pay uh, just to be more proactive and document everything and collect the receipts, don't throw it away. You will see that it will pay off. Yeah, they, considering how much the tax bill could be, right? For every dollar, it could save you at least a third in taxes. So it's a big deal. But yeah, uh, you know, buyers, they, they, most of buyers want to get a home in moving condition. But, you know, in the current environment we're in, uh, boy, have you seen the cost of uh, lumber or the cost of anything or even the availability? You know, it's like, I, I want to get that new refrigerator. Well, okay, you have to wait a year for it to show up. And we're talking about a local manufacturer too, not a overseas manufacturer. And we're kind of still in a um, short of supply. So, you know, the bidding wars and inventory. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm always concerned about that, especially our older clients who they've been in their house for 40 years and they've done nothing to it. But I think it's just a matter of spending a little bit of money, cleaning it up, cleaning it up, getting rid of the clutter. I think that's the thing, getting rid of the clutter and, make it presentable, but you don't have to remodel. It, it probably can look pretty good. Uh, there's a, a magazine called Remodeling Magazine. <clears throat> and, and, and take a look at the, the they, they always have these interesting issues. It's kind of fun to read. And um, the, the Remodeling Magazine gives some really good advice about update things that pay you back. Yeah, don't spend money that you're not gonna get a return on. And I, I agree with that. And, and every year that the article is updated, it changes and, and, and uh, the recommendations change. But what they're saying is improve your home's curb appeal to get the best return on investment. Because if, if a buyer pulls up to your house and it looks hideous, well, they're just going to not, not consider it or give you a super low bid because they don't think it's worth as much. And that could be a problem. Uh, they, their number one um, uh, return is garage door replacement. You recoup up to 94% of the costs. A uh, stone veneer on the exterior, 92% of the costs. Kitchen remodel, 72%. And you can go look up the recent issues. Um, I think the best money spent is getting a home inspection. And Katarina can make referrals to the various um, home inspectors out there. And if you do that, go with them, go with them, and they'll point things out to you. And that way you don't have any surprises. You know, once you agree on a price of the house and then the buyer hires a home inspector and bam, they come with all these problems, then they're going to ask for a discount. So get a home inspection. I think that's the best money you'd ever spend. I think it's a good idea. Um, and there's things that you and I don't see, obviously. And there's, the building codes change all the time too. So there could be some, uh, uh, we could be out of date on some building compliance issue. So, so that's very important. Now, what if, you have a married couple and one of the spouses passes away. What happens there? Well, here in California, we are a community property state. And what that means is you have a full step up in basis. And so what happens is, so for example, uh, grandma and grandpa bought their house for $100,000 50 years ago or so. Now it's worth a million dollars. Well, grandpa passes away and it's community property. So there's a full step up in basis. The basis is now a million dollars. And so if grandma decides to sell after grandpa passes away, a million minus million is zero, no capital gains tax. Now, let's say grandma lives a long time after that. She can add any improvements since 
the, uh, the, her spouse passed away to the basis of the home. So it's kind of like a reset. Now, last year, we were all concerned about what was going to change in the tax law. Well, we're going to lose the step up in basis. Well, I could give you an update. As we know right now is that the House of Representatives has passed the Build Back Better Act. In the version that was passed on November 19th, um, those changes in the tax law have been removed. So no increase in property in capital gains taxes, no increase in individual taxes, no um, elimination of the step up in basis and, and, and a whole plethora of other changes. However, the United States Senate still has to vote on that bill. We think that's probably not gonna happen until probably March or February. So stay tuned on that. Now, if you're in a non-community property state, which is mostly the United States, there's a step up for the deceased spouse's share. So, so if it's 50-50, half of it will get stepped up, half will be the original basis. And then, and, then, and then any improvement since death gets added to the cost basis of the property. Now, what if the property is owned as sole and separate property? So that could be an interesting situation. You have a husband, wife, but it's the wife's sole and separate property. So let's say the husband passes away, no step up in basis because he doesn't own the property. She owns it as sole and separate property. However, if she were to pass away, there'll be full step up in basis because it's her sole and separate property. But then we have to look at her estate plan. Who gets the house? Will it be the husband or will it be someone else? So estate planning is very important, especially when it comes to owning real estate. So, and I know, Katarina, we have our good friend, Brett, speaking uh, in a, a couple of weeks, right, uh, for some estate planning issues and Proposition 19. So there's some interesting details to consider there. So you can ask Brett a lot of good questions about that. Okay, so that's if you pass away. Now, what if uh, I have a home office, a home office, a lot of us work from home, and um, we have a home office. Well, when you have a home office, you are claiming depreciation on a portion of the house. So if you sell the house, you use, the, use it as a home office, you will pay capital gains tax on the depreciation you take. It's called recapture. And that's reported on Form 4797. That's the way it goes. Uh, a former rental, that gets a whole lot more complicated. It's beyond the scope of this webinar today. We can talk another two hours on those very complicated rules. And if, 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 um, if you want, we can have a whole webinar about former rentals and vacation homes. So can I use the exemption? It's gonna depend. The rules are very complicated. Um, uh, this was enacted, uh, oh, I think it was back in 2014 or something like that. So, so the laws are really complicated. It's called the disqualified use rules. And it can get quite confusing and I don't wanna go into it right now. But if you have a second home or a vacation home, it's not your principal residence. So you don't get the exclusion on a second home or a vacation home. You'll have to pay taxes on capital gains if you sell a second home or vacation home. If you happen to sell it for a loss, you can't claim a loss. It's a personal property, no capital loss. For a vacation home, because uh, it's a vacation home if you rent it out, um, when you're not using the property, there could be some depreciation recapture to consider. And it's mandatory. The big mistake people make is that, oh, I didn't claim it. So I, I don't have to recapture, right? No. If you didn't claim it, you're, you, you don't get the deduction, but you still got to claim the recapture. So you got to be careful about that. Okay, we're going to close out here with what if I have a large gain? What do I do? Because we see a lot of people with large gains. Uh, like the client I talked about who sold her house for 800 over asking. 800 over asking. Can you believe that? Um, and we've seen reports of houses going a million over asking. And, and the realtor thought they were being quite accurate with the listing price. But go figure. So make sure you have everything included in the cost base. That's number one. That's the most important thing. And, and do a spreadsheet and look around the house and say, ah, yeah, we did that roof. We added that addition. You know, uh, we added the deck. You know, make sure we get those all in there. You know, walk around the house and make sure you get it in there. Do it before you sell the house, not after you sold the house, because the buyers are probably not going to let you go back in the house and say, hey, can I check to see what I did? <laughs> They're not going to be happy with that. So we're not going to have enough time to go into extreme detail on these different strategies, but some, some strategies to consider. What if you do have a large gain of the house? 
we might consider a 1031 exchange. The good news about that is that we thought we were going to lose the ability to use a 1031 exchange because it was in the earlier version of the tax bill. That has been removed, so we still have that to use. Consider utilizing qualified opportunity zone funds where you can roll the gain into a qualified opportunity zone fund, which allows you to defer the taxes on this gain. That's another possibility. Or charitable giving strategies. And, and we've done that for many clients where you can donate a portion of your house to charity or take advantage of a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust. So let's give you an example of selling your home and taking advantage of section 1031. This is gonna take some tax planning. It's not an overnight thing, definitely not an after the fact thing. So let's say we have a house that's worth $2 million and your cost basis is $500,000. So if you sold the house, you'd have a million dollars of taxable gain. So let's say we rent the house out for less than three years. Then you sell the house for $2 million within those three years of when you convert to a rental. Then you take that 2 million, but only reinvest 1.5 million in a new property. So you rent out the new property so you can qualify for an 1031 exchange and you get a pocket $500,000 tax free because that's boot. 2 million minus 1.5 is 500. You get to keep the $500,000 tax free. Rent out this new house for uh, maybe a couple of years or so. Move back into it as your principal residence and there you just uh, avoided a uh, million dollars of capital gain. So that's, but it takes a few years to make this happen. It's not gonna be overnight. So like, um, so we were explaining there, you apply the sale of home rules first before the like kind exchange rules. So that's where we get the $500,000 exclusion there. And of course there's some depreciation route recapture you gotta consider. And if there's any boot, uh, if it's more than $500,000, anything above that will be taxable. And then the you have to uh, recompute the cost basis in the new property because you need to reduce this by, or actually you increase it by any gain that's recognized in the uh, relinquished property. <coughs> Here's another example. We got a house that costs $210,000. <coughs> You rent it out for two years, you claim $12,000 of depreciation. You exchange it for a new place for $470,000. You kept $10,000 in cash. And then you bought a new place for $460,000. And the gain you realize is $272,000. So, um, so basically the amount you realize is $470,000. And so the gain is 272, but you have this $250,000 exclusion, let's say you're single, then, then you defer the $22,000 of gain in this example. In this example here, there's no tax due because we able to take advantage of section 1031 and 121. So that's a pretty neat example here. All right, but you just gotta watch out for the five-year rule. You don't get to use the 121 exclusion if the house has been exchanged in the last five years. Qualified opportunity zone, you can defer all or portion of the gain. One word of warning though, um, is that uh, California did not adopt this law. So if you wanna use this, this only defers the federal taxes, not the California taxes. So you still gotta pay the California tax. You've got to reinvest within 180 days and there's a permanent exclusion of the gain if you hold this investment for at least 10 years. So um, it's, an, uh, it's something to think about. And, um, and it just defers the gains, but it's, a, it's an opportunity. It's, it's, it's a picking up in speed. More and more of these are happening right now because um, it's getting more and more popular. So keep an eye on these type of investments. Uh, I'm not gonna go over the detail in the math here. Uh, I don't really have enough time for this. And there's a, you know, you think about, should I do a 1031 or a QOZ? Well, with the QOZ is a lot easier. You don't have to rent out the property. So that could be uh, a consideration to think about. And also, also could be something we think about as after the fact. So not as much front end tax planning versus the 1031. It's gonna take a lot of planning to get there. All right, so I'm not gonna go into these details here. Let's talk about charitable giving. 
what can we do in terms of charitable giving? What, what can we do with that? So you can donate a portion of your house to charity. So for example, we have to do this before the house is sold, okay? Before an offer is accepted. So don't do it when the house is sold. You can't do that. So let's say we have a house that's uh, worth a million dollars. I'm gonna give 10% to charity. So we get an appraisal. The appraisal says the house is worth a million dollars. I'm gonna pick my favorite charity and give them 10%. 10% is $100,000. Now the charity is a co-owner of your house. So when you list your house on the market, not only you sell the paper, sign the papers, the charity needs to sign the papers, but you get a tax deduction for that $100,000 because you just donate the charity. Pretty good deal. Uh, you can give it, let's say we take that same example. We give it to a charity to fund what's called a charitable gift annuity. What's the advantage of a gift annuity? You get a deduction for funding the gift annuity, but you get income for the rest of your life from the annuity and is sponsored by like a major charity. Uh, my favorite ones are the um, American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, Habitat for Humanity. Every university can do it. So it's very common. For large gifts, a charitable remainder trust works. Um, one of my clients did that with their house in Atherton. They had a very big game in their house in Atherton. So they, uh, they decided to put half their house into the charitable remainder trust because they had a huge gain on the sale of their house. So the deduction from the donation to the charitable remainder trust offset the capital gains on the sale of the house. And they're getting income from the trust for the rest of their lives. And the minimum uh, payment is 5% of the value of the trust. That's the IRS says it's the minimum. So something to consider, something to consider is charitable giving. But for charitable giving to work, uh, you got to be charitable. Uh, if you're only care, if you're only concerned is the tax deduction, that's probably not going to be enough to go there. But you should have a charitable intent. So that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun, and love to talk to you more about that. So um, I'm going to close this out pretty soon. Um, earlier well, last year in 2021. In November of uh, 2020, we had the uh, passage of Prop 19. And so Katarina and I did a webinar on that. So uh, here's the YouTube link to that if you want to see that, or just go to my YouTube channel. You can see the Prop 19. You can ask Brett some more questions about Prop 19. Uh, there's going to be more changes in tax legislation. And I'll talk about that in a second here. But I hope this illustrates the importance of tax planning, planning instead of reacting to it, we can plan ahead of time. So what's uh, coming up? Uh, we're gonna do a 2021 and 2022 tax update. It was gonna be live. It was gonna be live at the San Mateo Library because of Omicron, it's been switched to, to a Zoom meeting. If you wanna sign up for that, it's through the uh, city of San Mateo. It's not through me, it's through the city of San Mateo. So just, Type in your computer, City of San Mateo calendar, boom, there's the calendar. Click over to January 20th of 2022, and then you see an entry for that says tax updates for 2021 tax returns and tax planning for 2022. Click on the registration tab, boop, and they'll take you to sign up. Now, last time I looked, there's only 17 seats left. So if it's full, call the library. And the man in charge is Paul Vaughn. So ask for Paul. Ask for Paul and say, hey, look, I, uh, I try to register, but it's full. So we'll, they'll figure something out if that's the case. So that's the next time. So I'm going to spend the last few, next few minutes here trying to answer some of the questions I see uh, coming through here. And if not, if we don't get to it, I uh, apologize for that. But we can uh, talk offline. So, and speaking about talking offline, here's my contact information here, or you can contact Katerina also. So uh, let's see if I can power through some of these questions here. And I, yes. see, I see my good friend, George. Hi, George. Uh, you got some good questions here. Um, uh, question about the 121 exclusion. Is it only two out of the five years? Two out of the last five years. That's why it's so important. Um, applies to federal in California. California has adopted the same law as the federal, so it'll follow that. Uh, do step up and basis apply to all community property? Yes, it does. 
Yes, it does. As long as the property is held as community property. So that's important. And I think that's another Brett question to ask when he does this seminar is about titling a property because uh, we run into some scary situations where the titling was not right and someone passes away and the importance of, of, of beneficiary designations. Okay. George, this is another question. Are you saying you take advantage of 121 and 1031? Yes, you can with proper planning. Um, can you do charitable giving to one more than one charity? Certainly, you can do it to more than one charity. My wife and I own our home for more than five years. She moved to an assisted living facility for medical reasons. How long do I have to take the exclusion? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so so um, it's that two out of five year rule, but I think uh, the assisted living gives us kind of a uh, an exemption for for her being somewhere else. So I think that you should still be able to take advantage of that. So I think we're okay there. Okay, let's see. We have some questions uh, uh, in the chat as well. Okay. If you deducted capital improvements in the past, how's it addressed in sales costs? Well, if you have capital improvements, you can't deduct it. So I hope you didn't because they wouldn't qualify for that. Um, what about document costs from decades ago? Yeah, well, if the if it's still there, like if the flooring is still there, the uh, the walls are still there, the the uh, carpets are still there, that that can still be counted. But if they're gone, they've been replaced, then you don't count the stuff that's been replaced. Okay, but still, you know, it's still important to keep the receipts. Okay, is there a California tax on in addition to fifteen percent federal tax on gain? Does it make the total tax? 30%. So the federal has its own calculation. The state has its own calculation. Yeah. So when it comes to calculating the tax bill, you don't just multiply the gain times the tax rate. It's not that simple. Unfortunately, we have multiple layers of taxes. We have capital gains taxes, regular taxes, net investment income tax, possibly the alternative amendment tax. Uh, in California, we have the mental health tax. So we have a lot of taxes to consider. So it's a, a a pretty detailed analysis we need to do to do to figure out what the tax bill is going to be. Yeah, it's not as simple as just multiplying by a number. Um, if the deed reads the husband and wife are joint tenants, can they have a step up in basis? And it gets a little bit complicated. So I would recommend consulting with an estate planning attorney to get the titling updated. Um, because uh, if it's really community property, we should have it titled as community property to to get the full step up in basis. So yeah, so got to take a look at how your properties are titled. It's a very important step to do. Okay, I know we went through this pretty fast. We went through a lot of material here. And uh, uh, I think we're down to our last minute, Katarina. Do you have any closing statements? Uh, yes, I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar, and uh, we will share with you a link to the recorded copy uh, version of it, and also uh, the slides. Uh, Larry, can we share the slides with uh, yeah. everyone? Yeah, okay. we can share a link to the slides. All right, then we will follow up. And then a quick reminder, we have not talked today about Proposition 19 in details, just briefly, Larry mentioned it. And there will be a webinar on Proposition 19 update with an estate planning attorney next month on February 12th. That would be Saturday, time is the same from two to 3 p.m. If you are interested, uh, do let me know and I will share with you the RSVP link. Also, we mentioned today about 1031 exchange. Uh, I did uh, a webinar in December on that topic. If you are interested to see a recorded version of that webinar, I can share with you the link. Uh, just make sure you send me an email and I'll follow up. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Larry, thank you so much for your time to share your knowledge with everyone. And again, the conversation will continue offline. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to contact either me or Larry, and we'll do our best to address it. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. And until next time. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Bye-bye.